Hi guys, Matt Lemke here with Three Gamer Goggles and Paizo, Eric Mona, and Jason Bulmont. And we are uh, set up day at Gen Con. So it's day Gen Con, what, three for you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Quiet before the storm. Yeah. And it's going to be a storm. I'm actually amazed this year at how few people are not set, or how few are set up and how many aren't already. Oh, you mean in the exhibit well, hall? The exhibit hall is yeah. a mess right now. Yeah. Normally by now it's in much better shape. Uh, but anyway. It'll be perfect by the time people come in tomorrow, I'm sure. Mostly. Yeah. yeah. Mostly. Yeah. Um, your boots are already done. <laughs> yeah, it's getting there. Yeah. I didn't see anybody working, so maybe you got to get those goblins. We've, uh, well, it's we've possible uh, we're, we're in, up. I think we start on Sunday. Yeah. So we get into that room Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday before any of the attendees actually yeah. access it. So it's really nice for you guys. It's really warm in there. Well, it's super it's, nice. It's great considering a quarter of the exhibit hall is now our booth, or at least well, it feels that way. <laughs> no, it's not quite that big, but yeah, it's uh, it's the yeah, it's a big booth. So we're going to talk. Well, maybe all things Paizo, but we're definitely going to talk about all things Pathfinder Second Edition, right? Um, and man, what a ride! <laughs> I, I finally got to play through the playtest. It only took me a year. Wow. You well, played all the way through? Did you do Doomsday uh, Dawn? Or? We did Doomsday Dawn, and we are in the fifth adventure, but wow. I've played... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> are you playing or GMing? I'm GMing. Oh, okay. oh well, all right. Um, so, and, and that's actually all I've done, and I've actually GMed with... Uh, Three different groups. Oh, great! So uh, I've got actually feedback from like fifteen different players. Cool. And as a GM, I cannot tell you how much I like the three action system. It's monsters are so fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean we're hearing that uh, from pretty much everyone. Yeah, and, and I, mean, I would say experiencing it ourselves as well. Yeah, I mean, is the, is the three action economy? I just said. Uh, Ten minutes ago, in front of another group, it's like it's kind of the killer app of the of the, the system, I think. And it, and it, it is the thing that you know we knew when we built it was that it was so much better for players and player mechanics. What and is it? Just in case people. So so what it is is uh, in Pathfinder Second Edition, whenever uh, you're in the middle of a combat and it's 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 your turn, you get to take three actions, and and we don't really put a lot of restrictions on that. You know, whatever whatever you want to do, these things take actions, right? So if you want to stand up, that's an action. If you want to swing a sword, that's an action. Open a door, close a door, you know, uh, get something out of your backpack. All these things are just one action. So it's, it's really easy to parse out your turn and figure out what you need to do. And then uh, most characters have a bunch of special things they can do with their actions, right? Those that, that comes from your character choices. So, you know, and some of those might take two actions. Like most spells take two actions to cast. Um, and it just kind of opens up the game to a more tactical feel. It, it has a better flow and ebb to it because you no longer have to worry, oh, am I doing my move action first or my standard first or am I going to combine those two to a full? Like, first edition had so many different action types that it really made the game uh, a bit of a, a, of, a, of a mess to kind of sort. What's a memorization challenge? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, you had all these different pieces you had to put together. So, um, but the thing that, that we really found that was really exciting that I've, I've been doing more and more of is uh, the three action system really opens it up for GMs. Like what you can do with monsters is all of a sudden far more dramatic, far more interesting than just kind of the monster walks up and attacks you until it's dead. Yeah, that's one way to say it. I mean, the, I was just looking at dragons in the bestiary and <laughs> they're, they're multiple attack and then they still have a second possibility to do an attack and cast a spell after doing two claw strikes and a bite. That's gross. You're they're not, vicious. Yeah, they're yeah. not. Well, they should be. They're yeah. dragons. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, they're dragons. Yeah, well, and that's. I think one of the things that that system allows you to do is it's a currency in a sense, right? And so if yes. you as a game designer are like, I really want this monster to be able to do something pretty cool. With second edition, you can say, all right, well, maybe that's a two action activity or three yeah. action activity. Yeah, even. And so you just have a lot more opportunities within, I think, a little bit of a broader range of power, so to speak, yeah. um, to make the monster do the things thematically you want the monster to do in a fight. And yeah. often that's backed up with mechanics that make the tactical element of the fight more interesting. It also helps us gate out, you know, like, oh, we don't want you to do this more than once per turn, no matter what. Right. So it's two actions. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. Solved. Yes. Or it's a single action with a flourish trick. That's right, yeah, no, it's a point. Yeah, you can also I'm, do I'm that. Yeah, no, there you go. One of the other things you guys did that I actually liked a lot was your removed attack of opportunity, kind of. 
For most, most, yeah, most people don't have it as a default. So yeah. like uh, monsters, characters whose main well, shtick so is fighting and being uh, super and alert, a lot of them do have it. But yeah. kind of part of the fun of a new second edition encounter, especially as everyone's still learning the game, is you don't really know which creatures have it, which creatures don't. And so I think that the impetus is to assume they don't, because most of them don't. And so it's a lot less risky to move around in combat, and that adds dynam dynamics to the combat as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think of it like that. One of the things I noticed is I think it speeds up combat. Yeah. yeah. That's well, lack thereof. Well, I, I, you know, uh, everybody gets one reaction from the start of their turn to the start of their next turn. But not everybody can use it. And even, even those who can use it, sometimes they can just kind of, they know they're not going to use it, right? If you have a rogue with nimble dodge but there's no monsters next to you, you never have to worry about using that ability. Uh, at that moment, you can just sit on it and it's fine. And, and you don't have to worry about slowing down the game and checking every every time something happens. Um, with Tax Opportunity, everybody had that in first edition. Everybody, even the wizard, you know, even if you just had a stick, right? So, and, and that, that would really slow down the game whenever anybody would trigger, and all of a sudden there's eight more dice rolls that need to happen. Yes. And, and, uh, it was fun, but I don't know that it made for the best gameplay. I think actually what it ended up doing is paralyze people. You know, so people oh, yeah. people will say, "Oh, I wish I could move over to help my buddy," or whatever. But I don't want to risk getting that attack of opportunity. I'm not going to uh, do it. And uh, it's sad because, as often as not, that that attack would have missed. Yeah. That attack would have been four points of damage. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, That's and fair. so you end up kind of just like, "Oh, I don't want to risk it," without fully understanding uh, it's not that big of a risk. And so you would end up with combats that were all about moving toward each other, standing still, and just attacking yeah, until just, it was over. Yeah. Well, and that obviously, I mean, I I enjoyed that for ten years, but it's been a revelation to see that just by well, adding that well, that three action it, it economy, doesn't have to be that it way. doesn't yeah, yeah exactly exactly i don't know if you realize this or not but i saw you hanging out at the warhammer booth last year so i suppose some of combat has kind of evolved from your your love of miniature wargaming too because the action economy system is almost like every miniature wargame i've ever played well, I think, you know, one of the things that I really stress on, on the Paizo Design team is a, a deep fluency in all the games that are out there, right? You know, because we're not making a game in a vacuum. We're making a game that has to exist alongside every other game that's out there. And knowing what our game is good at and designing to those strengths, um, while also not, you know, just stepping on someone else's idea or doing the exact same thing is important to me, right? You know, our, our game has to stand on its own legs and merit. And the only way to do that is to have a deep understanding of all the games that are out there. Well, I think it's also important, too. I mean, Pathfinder is a game where combat is important. You know, it is, yes, it is a role-playing game. But it's also a role-playing game, you know, and yeah. part of the game to it is having a grid and moving your characters around and positioning and tactical interests and options that that creates for a more compelling narrative. So it's not just theater of the mind, it's not just play acting, it's actually a game. And, uh, and the way that some of this stuff interacts with that, and then the idea that maybe there's some similarities with miniatures games. I mean, if you strip away some of the character building, some of the, the role-playing, some of the story, it isn't that similar from a miniatures game, but it's very basic. So thinking yeah. about how those things overlap and, and where we can learn from a different type of game, and the same thing is true with computer games, we learn from that. How you present like a feet tree kind of a thing. How, how do you present choices that are easier for people to intuit? Those are some things that we might be able to pull from the computer side of things. So it's, it's not a world like it was maybe when we first got into the hobby where it's like, I'm a miniatures war gamer. I am a role playing gamer. I play Atari. No. You know, it's like it's everything is, is lives together in an ecosystem. We can all learn from each other. The play test you get you, you put a game in front of four hundred thousand people and they tell you what, you know, uh, you're doing wrong or what they prefer that you change or what have you. So um, so yeah, so it's exciting and uh, and uh, there is a lot of cross pollinization and some DNA as well from other games. It's just by far. <laughs> Um, you were going to say. Oh, no, so, uh, you know, when, at, at its heart, you know, you go back to the beginnings of role-playing games, and they started out as miniatures games, right? Yeah. So that DNA still still thrives, right? And, and it, it's expressed more in some games than others, but That's right. in Pathfinder, it's an important part. Okay, so what were, or what are, what do you think some of the subtle changes from the playtest to 2.0 that might be missed initially by players? Um, 
I think we change so many things, it can kind of become difficult even to track what things change, right? Um, there were so many elements where it's like, we did a spells past and cleaned up a bunch of conditions that were problematic, right? That, that you know, we had two bonus types. One was called <laughs> conditional and one was called circumstance. circumstance. And we changed conditional to status. And just so that it was cleaner and easier to understand. That's a small change. It's just a terminology change to make it easier for everyone to remember what's what and not be like, wait, which bonus is that? And have to look it up. Um, little things like that don't appear to be big changes, but in fact have a really big impact on how smoothly the game plays, right? The, the less we are asking you to go look in the book to double check what a bonus is, uh, the better off we are as, as a game. So there's a lot of things like that. I mean, there's obviously the big things like, you know, um, signature skills and resonance went away. But literally, there are, there are small changes all over the game, yeah. like feats that got tweaked or adjusted based on feedback on the fighter, right? Uh, alterations to the ranger based on its popularity and, and how much we actually saw it getting used. Champion. Yeah, the, the change from paladin to champion, right? Um, you know, all of that uh, was based on player feedback and uh, you know is there to, to kind of make a better game. I think an interesting change that stands out to me, and I don't know how <coughs> subtle it is, because it actually is one of the, the first changes you're going to encounter in the core rulebook if you've been playing the playtest. But Jason, some of the changes you guys made to Ancestry, in particular with the Heritages, yeah. I think was, oh, yeah. it was a good example of something that came from the audience, fundamentally. And then also that when the implementation of that change opens up a whole bunch of other opportunities. Can you talk about that a little bit? So one of the things that we heard in the playtest was that uh, folk didn't feel like the ancestry was quite giving them enough. Mm -hmm. And to top it off, the way that the ancestry feats were built meant that you could like suddenly grow sharp teeth, right? It's like, oh, I gained a bright right. attack oh, I get dark at fifth vision level. At fifth level. How does yeah. that happen? How does how do right. my eyes just get better right. randomly? Right. And and we took all that to heart because it was a flaw with with the way it was working. And we decided that you know what, you should probably have a little bit more in your ancestry. Your, your ancestry should probably have a bit of a deeper expression and, and a little bit more choice in it. So heritage was the good middle ground on that. It says, hey, there are physical things about your ancestry. This is the one that you're expressing. Um, and then all of the other things, which were mostly like training or social or based on the culture, things that you could conceivably learn later, right, right. those remain feats. Um, so w what that does is it allows us to kind of look back at all of the races from first edition and as we convert them into ancestries for second, it opens up kind of a good roadmap on how to build those and, and how to make them true to the original and still uh, kind of fun and filled with interesting choices. Well, and there's a couple of examples out in the core book itself in the form of the half-elf and the half-orc, which are human yeah, yeah. heritages. And so I remember, oh, yeah, you know, course, making yeah. some of my uh, my initial characters in the playtest, and oh, let's, oh, there's a new way of making a half-orc, let's try that. But because of the way that the decisions were built in the playtest, it almost seems suboptimal. I'm like giving up a choice yeah. to make yes. myself a better human because I wanted to be a half orc. Now with the heritage choice, that seems less of a, a well. Problem. And, and and we don't do it in the core rulebook, but you know uh, the half elf and half orc are obviously based off the, the human yeah. heritage. Um, they don't necessarily have to be though, right? I mean, I, I could see I could see a world in which you were like, oh, I'm a dwarf half orc. In fact, I think there's right. a sidebar about that. Yeah. In the book. Um, and in the future, that opens up a lot of possibilities right. for us. When you when you start looking at like the plain touch races like ASMR and Tiefling and right. stuff, those definitely are not only human. So having ways for others to be able to kind of gain access to those without us having to reinvent the wheel every time right. well, is, is, is better for cute. the entire game ecosystem. I, I remember one of my first videos on like character creation or something for the playtest and People are like, well, why can't we do half to work? That came up a lot. Or why can't we do a half half? Like, 
I'm like a half, half lane, quarter lane, <laughs> quarter lane, yeah, no, quarter lane. Not. You know, I'm like, well, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't know. Well, what I to mean, say. the answer is that traditionally, you know, half orc and half elf have always, always been, been associated with humans. But what Jason's saying is absolutely right. I mean, there's there's no reason that you have to do it that way. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure the portal book itself has a, like a little sidebar that kind of gives you tacit permission to, to think about messing around yeah. with it. We may follow it up. With well, action. GMs do that anyway. Well, so. and I think that you know, a half a half orc is a little bit different than say a tiefling. You know. Yeah. It's like that the idea behind a, a tiefling is you know somewhere in the past of my uh, my family tree uh, somebody had a dalliance with a fiend and you know not not mom not grandma not, you know you never know right but it's it it, it, it works its way down and, and uh, the heritage just gives you a better opportunity to do that and you can map it to different well I mean there's no limit to how many heritages you can get I mean, I mean, there is. Well, I mean, each character can only add one. That is no, no, I mean, like, but, but as a company and as yeah, just yeah, in terms company. of exactly. adding options yeah. to the game, that's that's exactly right. Yeah. And, and, that's and it won't be long, you know, until uh, right now it's like, yeah, your options are the core rule book. And there's tremendously more options, it feels like to me, in the core rule book than there was in, say, the first edition core rule book. But, you know, to be honest, there's fewer options in the core rule book than there are in. Ten years of hardcovers for first. Oh, yeah, for sure. So you know we're going to be getting to a lot of that stuff fairly soon. There'll be some announcements. Like in two minutes. Oh, <laughs> you heard it here first. Sort of. I've got some questions Great, rolling around my head. But no, um, this one's more specific to the bestiary. So there are some of the races that were traditionally playable races. I didn't delve too much into it so far because, like, I got it Friday. Are they considered playable now in 2.0? No. Okay. That's no. what I thought. Not yet. No. Uh, the best area in, unlike Starfinder, for example, where we put a lot of rules for playing those aliens in your campaign, um, the structure of Pathfinder 2 is such that in order to say, let's say we wanted to do a kobold as a playable ancestry, we'd really want to present, you know, eight pages of material, we, yeah, we need four lots of different choices yeah. uh, uh, at each yeah. time you get a new ancestry feed, and then again, choices within those choices to make sure that not all kobold characters are the same. Yeah. So, you know, kobolds, for example, in... Pathfinder has, share some draconic uh, heritage, and so they often have different colored skin that associates with the, the dragon that they yeah. have. So, is a blue scale kobold different than a black scale kobold? Well, we haven't gotten an official answer to that question yet, but we might, right? Yeah. And, that, and, and that's more than just a sidebar in a bestiary. And so, especially too, because we know there's a lot of people who really want as much of that existing rules framework as soon as possible. So that's why, for example, the, the monster creation guidelines are going to be in the game master book, not in the bestiary. Because if we can put those things in that one book, game mastery guide, game master wants to make a new monster, he goes, grabs that book, we don't have to reprint those rules every bestiary. That's ten more monsters we can get in a monster book. You know what I mean? And so so um, we we will be getting to kobolds for sure. Um, we will be getting to kind of what I would call that first tier the set of first edition races very shortly. Um, and then we're also doing some oddball stuff. I mean, in the in the uh, Pathfinder uh, Lost Omens character guide, which comes out in uh, October, um, that's the second of our world books that we're putting out for second edition. And it's got three new ancestries in it. It's got the Hobgoblin, it's got the Lizard Folk, and it's got Leshies, which are plant creatures. Uh, it's kind of a... Uh, they came out a bit midway through first edition and have really gotten some traction. They're cute and fun. And, and again, it's like... Uh, my own sense of fantasy and, and the characters I tend to play are a little less sort of on the the cute side as that necessarily, but I think one of the things that's really important is that Pathfinder's a game that's not just for me, it's not just for Jason, it's for everybody. So when we're talking about what ancestries we want to put in that book, there are members of the staff who just light up at the idea of Leshies in the book, and so it's like, you know what, let's give that a shot. There's probably other players who are excited about it. So when we announced that book uh, not too long ago, there were a fair number of people who were like, well, that's cool. And Hobgoblin, I understand, lizard folk kind of, but like, where's the tieflings? You know, where's the where's the rat folk? Where's the cat folk? Where's the the kind of the 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 most obvious ones? And my answer is, ask me again at the end of Gen Con, and I'll probably have an answer for you. But you're interviewing me on the first day of Gen Con. This so won't, this won't go up till Sunday. <laughs> so we'll have an answer for that soon, and and uh, that's something that, that that you know we'd like people to kind of understand is that there is definitely. 
the core rules, and that, that is the, the core rule book and the bestiary. But there's also kind of that extended core rules to some degree, and that's the Game Master Guide. The, uh, and I'm talking uh, first edition here, but the Advanced Player's Guide, a couple of other key things. And that material, not necessarily every spell or every feat, but in terms of the broad strokes, that's material we want to get into the ecosystem sooner rather than later. Sure. So, I guess the next big thing to talk about is multi-classing. Uh, it it kind of got nerfed. <clears throat> mm. Kind of. Well, that's I, interesting. Jason, well, would you say so, it's a nerf? So, I wouldn't... A nerf is... I, I think in first edition, the way multi-classing worked was both um, very empowering, if you knew how to do yes. it right, but also could very easily lead you down the road of having a character that was below kind of... Uh, uh, the the equivalent single class character, um, and a lot of that had to do with the way classes were built. First edition, right? How they how so many of what you so much of what you got in first edition was based on kind of these growing trees of powers and ability. Well, if you cut off that tree and just start growing a second one, you end up with two trees that are short. And that might be really good if you, if, you, if you find a way to, to synergize those two things together, it's going to work great. But if you don't, eh, now you end up with kind of none of the good abilities that you need to have for, to be the level of character that you are. So when it came time for us to look at second edition, we really said, you know what, this, we can't have customizing your character and adding flavor and story to your character along with interesting abilities. That can't come at the cost of the core of what your character is that you decided to build. So if you're building a wizard, the thing you're not trading away is your spell casting. That's not, you know, because if you trade those things away, all of a sudden you're not performing in the way that the game needs you to perform. I, I would definitely agree with the statement of your, your full-time job stays fundamental to the class or the character. Yeah. Um, well, and that, that's... That, that, that's helpful not just to you, but it's helpful to the other people at the table, yes. because they know what you're bringing to the table, right? When you say, oh, I'm a wizard with the fighter archetype, they still know that you have powerful <laughs> wizard spells right. to call upon. They, they well, do you? I mean, okay, yeah. so maybe I'm reading it wrong, but you don't seem to get... Maybe it's because I haven't made it yet. Sure. Maybe, you know, like, out to 10th level, but it doesn't seem like you get nearly as good as you used to Multi-classing like fire wizard, which is it's fair and good, but I mean it's like it seems like you have a, a much more limited amount of spells so, compared to the wizard in second edition. So, so in first edition, if you were to make a let's just take a fifth level wizard, fifth level fighter, right? That character is going to have third level spells, yes, and is going to have a base attack bonus of seven, yes, um, uh, yeah, seven, uh, and. So you're not as good as a fighter who would have a base attack bonus, a straight fighter who would have a base attack bonus of 10, right. um, which also then gets him past the critical uh, focus and critical specialization threshold, um, which you need BAB8. And Gage you're not, edition. yeah, I still got it. Uh, and, and on the wizard side, you're not even going to have fourth level spells, let alone fifth level spells. So you, the number of spells that you're going to have is, is, is pretty small compared to a... 10th level wizard. Okay. Now let's go over to, to, to second edition. In second edition, if I were to say, okay, I'm going to be a wizard and I'm a 10th level character, I have the same number of spells as a 10th level wizard, right? That doesn't have the archetype. What I paid was some of my wizard class feats. Instead of becoming better at meta magic and getting enhanced ways to add actions to my spells to have them do bigger effects or do better things, Instead of getting those choices, instead I go and grab the fighter archetype. And what that does is give me training in weapons and some training in armor. And that's the first thing I get. And then as I throw more class feats into the fighter archetype, I gain things like attack of opportunity, or I can. I can gain um, the ability to pick up other fighter feats, and like sudden charge, right? So all of a sudden I'm a wizard who can still cast wizard spells, but because I gained proficiency, and proficiency is always based off level, I'm now, I'm not as good as a straight fighter, but I am much better than an average wizard, and I still have all my wizard spells and abilities. And you 
it really what it's like, it's unlocking an extra list of choices when you yeah. get that class fee. Yeah. So if, if for some reason you want to actually take that, like you're, you're, you're multi-classing into fighter, yeah. but there's a wizard feat still, yeah. one of your choices that, that speaks your character concept or gives you some yeah. mechanical niche that you're trying to fill, you can still take that. Yeah, you know? you're not so it's, it, Right, exactly. So what it, what it fundamentally does is that when I sit down with a player who's saying, I'm playing a wizard with fighter archetype, I still know that I can count on that player to be a, a, an appropriately powerful spellcaster. Right. What I just learned, though, by them saying that is, I shouldn't expect a whole bunch of tricks and modifications to their spells because they've sacrificed a bunch of those feats right. to pick up basic fighter ability. And that means they're going to be up there swinging their sword around and they probably have spells that are filled with like touch attacks and stuff that they can use up close. Uh, but I still know that they're going to be, you know, if I really need to dispel magic, they might have it. Right. Uh, and I didn't notice in the the new book, the core book, prestige classes. Did you guys get rid so, of them? So or are they coming later? In, in, in first edition, we had three different little subsystems all trying to do the same thing. Multi-class and archetypes and prestige classes. And all three of them basically said, mm, change your character. Like, exactly. fundamentally alter the core concept of your character. So for second edition, we said, you know what, we shouldn't do this three different ways. We should do it one way and do it right. Um, so archetypes really are the solution to all three of those. Now, the core book just has multi-classic. But very soon, in, uh, in, in some of the world guides, you start in to fact, see... In fact, in the, uh, the Lost Omens world guide that comes out on, uh, on August 28th. Yeah. So we're only three weeks away from... Okay. You start getting archetypes as well that aren't just multi-class archetypes that are like, nope, I want to be a uh, Hell Knight Armager, right. and uh, I can start adding those abilities to my character. So, but when you talk about prestige classes, the only thing that makes that different than any other class is that you have to meet certain prerequisites to take it. Well, we can just add prerequisites to an archetype. That's not okay. That's not hard. And then no, we're just hard. like, yeah, and you have to wait till your eighth level to get this. And I think that that speaks to really the main design goals of Pathfinder Second Edition, which is making it easier to learn, faster to play, and have a depth of character creation options, right? And so one of the things is if you've got one way of doing those three different things. You only have to learn how to do archetypes one time. You don't learn archetypes and figure that out, then go learn prestige classes and go, well, that works sort of similar, but now I'm confused. You've learned it once. And so that's that you can apply that to a lot of different elements of how Pathfinder 2nd Edition works. Um, and it, I mean, even archetypes themselves, essentially it's just giving you other class feats to pick. And so that's something you're already familiar with from your, from your character class. So it, it makes the game easier to pick up. As well. So, what's this going to do to things like the skull in the future? Are, are those going to those type of classes going to be recreated? Jason, what do you, how do you want to answer I, that one? I, I think the thing to keep in mind is that you know Pathfinder First Edition had forty classes in it by the end. Forty, big, 40 yeah. 41, I think yeah, it's a, lot. Is a, lot. <clears throat> a lot. I think a lot of those will make perfectly awesome Second Edition classes when we get around to them. Uh, but I think there are some. That I look at and I'm like, that's probably just an archetype, right? And in, yep. in the new system, this probably even works as a better concept as an archetype. <laughs> because archetypes can now be taken by anybody. So, like in the playtest, we had the Cavalier in yes. the playtest as an archetype. Not as a class, it was an archetype. And um, nobody seemed to be bothered by that. And being like, no, a Cavalier... Is a is a mounted warrior, and basically what this what this archetype does is it gives you a mount, and it gives you some of the banner abilities that the class had in, in first edition, and and that's it. And if you want to add that to a fighter or a champion or a, you know a cleric or even a wizard, you can do that. And now you're a mounted, you know, banner waving character, and that's because that's the concept you want to be. And I think that works kind of even better than making it its own class. Um, in some cases, so. but that's, that's not always going to be the case. And so. importantly, it was a play test, and it's yeah. not in the final version. So, yeah. But it might be in an upcoming book, right? Yep. And yeah. right. that's the route that we decide to go. The Skull's an interesting one. I think that, the, well, you know, from my perspective, and this is just me speaking as a gamer more than as a publisher, so take it for what it's worth. But, you know, the some of the classes that have really unique and kind of special niches, I'm thinking in particular like, uh, the summoner or the, the kineticist or the gunslinger. Yeah. You know, classes that, that, yeah, you could say, well, that's just a special kind of wizard, that gunslinger is a special kind of fighter, or something. You could. But those ones, I think, 
are harder to just say, well, it's just an archetype. But then there are other ones that we're going to have to take a real close look. And, and from my perspective, some of the ones from the advanced class guide, where really, that's what we call the hybrid classes here. And so, in a way, what we were almost trying to do with those was to create an archetype that maps onto that class for its whole existence. The whole existence. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, stuff like the skull, they're going to get a close look. You know? Yeah, and, close and to be totally honest, the skull is not in my top 10. Like what would be the next classes I would do anyway? There's right. there's lower right. hanging fruit than that. Um, but we are gonna we're gonna very shortly have the discussion I think about every single first edition class and at least get a sense for ourselves yeah, of which bucket these things fall. In. Yeah, and it comes down to the strength of its conceptual niche and the yep. strength of its mechanical niche. So yep. if it has a good concept and good mechanics in first edition, that's a pretty good indicator that it's gonna find a home in yep. second edition as a okay. class. If it's light on one of those two. Uh, maybe it won't. Maybe we just need to do a little bit more work. <clears throat> maybe or, it's not. Or, you know, especially if it has a very strong story niche, but its mechanical niche is, is not as strong. Well, we might take that and re-envision the class. Totally. Right? I mean, you know, I, I think the one thing that I want to stress to, to folk is that it, because it worked one way in first edition, does not mean it will work that way in second edition. Take the Alchemist, for example. Yeah. We, we completely rebuilt how that class works to make it more in tune with its Twice. incredibly, yeah, <laughs> to make it more in tune with its kind of incredibly strong conceptual niche. Right. But the mechanical niche on it was pretty much just, I don't know, it's like spells in a bottle. And that, that wasn't a very strong mechanical niche. So we rebuilt it and we made it its own stronger, unique identity class. We'll be doing that with some others. Well, and interestingly, as a result of that <clears throat> choice for the alchemist, <clears throat> the book now contains, I don't know, 15 pages or something of alchemical items yeah, that, yeah. that, you know, are, you, you know, job. as an adventure designer, that's more treasure I can put yeah, into exactly, adventures. Yeah. As an as a alchemist, that's more cool stuff I can build. You know, so making that choice with the alchemist, I think, ended up enriching the game yeah. for everybody else as well. And so that's, for me, that's a win-win. If we can do that kind of a thing uh, with some of these other clients, you know, Gunslinger's a great example. We have to figure out how to do guns. You know, we yeah. have to figure out how to have a class that specializes in guns. But once we figure that stuff out, and you want to have guns in your setting, all of those guns will be in the game, right? Yeah. And so, and, uh, you know. Range is hard in role playing, I think. I Playing a lot of different role-playing games, I think yeah. it, it makes things a lot more difficult for a GM and it's, for players and power balance and all that stuff. So, but good luck. Know, I just, I, again, I, I I hate to come across as a geek and a gamer guy because I am a geek and I am a gamer guy. But like, I'm just sitting here thinking about like how the infrastructure of second editions class feats and weapon features and 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 weapon traits. I'm like. You I'm, I'm sitting here going. designing yeah. rifles in my head while I'm supposed to be talking to you because it's That's okay. the, I like it. the tools that <laughs> they've created on the, the design Jason and his team have created, I, it just like, I feel like I have so many more tools as a GM and as a, as a writer oh. to be able to kind of, like if, if, if you'd come to me the day after they designed the guns, gun rules for first edition and said, Eric, we'd like you to take a crack at designing 10 new guns. I would have been tremendously uh, uh, apprehensive about doing that, feeling like, well, I don't even know where to start. Uh, I would still totally mess it up, and they would have to redo it. But I would be using tools that they've provided yeah. that I think would get us a lot closer. We're, we're speaking the same language, yeah. at least. Yeah. 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 And I agree. I think uh, Pathfinder 2.0 is much more friendly to a GM who's trying to do their own like their own thing, their own homebrew world, or just create stuff new with the small amount of information we have compared to what's been out there for, I don't know, 15 years? It's been 15 years, right? It's been, no, it's been, well, for us, it's been 10, 10 years for Pathfinder, but of course it's an evolution 3 .5. of 3.5, which yeah, has been out for a while, and so, um, I mean, part of the fun, I think, of a new edition, too, is like, Everything old is new again. There's tons of surprises. You know, there's there's yeah. so oh. many neat little things that my players will pull out. I mean, I proofread the book. I've read the whole book, but it's not the same as playing a campaign or running the character. And so frequently, one of my players will pull out something, especially since we shipped it from the play test to the real oh, world. Yeah. And it's like, what? Oh, that's so cool. I think that, oh my God, that's so cool. That phrase comes up so much. Um, it's pretty neat. Well, I like dying. My, my play, it makes my players think a lot more. <laughs> uh, that that is that is that was one of the hardest things for us to get. We iterated right. that about five or six times. Uh, the internal least. internal count on that was like eight or nine. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, the, the external we did four or five different versions. And you know, it, well, it's one of those things that it's such an important moment in the game that having the rules make it pop uh, yeah. is, 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 is one of the trickiest things to design, period. Because on one hand, you want to make sure the players have all the tools to save their characters' lives. On the other hand, you don't want those tools to be so easy that death loses all of its teeth. And yeah. like, it's just this balancing act of trying to find this perfect middle ground where everyone is afraid, but you also know what it takes to fix it. But all of that still comes with cost. And, uh, and, and, and that's, the, that's that moment. I, I, I really wanted to get to that place where the moment somebody goes unconscious and is dying, the whole party kind of leans in a little bit towards the table because they know that th there's real trouble right now. Yeah, and fixing this goals. just like, they, I, I, it can be paralyzing. I, I love that moment where the party panics yep. uh, because no, someone went down and they, they start making bad decisions like to try and save the character yep. and the game isn't as rich so unless the system makes that happen. But Nothing's worse than being like, it's oh, you're only at negative two. Well, you have 14 yeah, more rounds before you oh, die. Okay, yeah, I'll just ignore you for 12 rounds. Yeah. You're my friend. You're bleeding to death. But, yeah. but I know uh, mechanically uh, you're, the yeah. fight's not going to go 12 rounds, so I really don't even have to worry yeah. about it. So, yeah, there's more narrative elements to it now. Oh, I think. Um, it, I, I it's very you. interesting. And there's weird penalties. You know, there's like, okay, now I'm back from from the dying condition, but now I'm wounded, wounded. and that yeah. means I might be easier for me to die. Bye. There's a hero point mechanic that's part of the game, so yeah. you get these, these, we make points for them, but you can use anything. And it's like, uh, okay, you get one for the beginning of the session, you get one for doing something truly awesome. Um, well, if you, if you want to recover from dying, you have to cash in all of your hero points. And maybe you have one, maybe you have three, maybe you have more. Yeah. You throw them all mm -hmm. in, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are ways that the system has built in to, to kind of make that moment even more impactful at the table. It's yeah, exciting. it's definitely, I mean, the manicure. <laughs> oh yeah, we, uh, t uh, we hideous laughter, the manicure. My team did, it was awesome. That's well, a very powerful spell. See, maybe I was, you know, maybe I should have toned it down a little bit because three characters and two companions against mm -hmm. the manicure. Wow, yeah, yeah, wow. That's a little rough. It was rough. It's a little rough. It was yeah, rough. It's a little rough. They got parallel. I mean, not undoable, but a little rough. My well, team of rank amateurs took it out, so I don't know if that's good or bad for you, Matt. But the, the one guy was like, "I don't need my companion," so his companion just stood at the back and did nothing. Oh no! I'm like, "You're, you're a fool." <laughs> you know, it occurs to me that by the time it's like stories from Eric's Doomsday Dawn, but but. Uh, by the time I got that in kind of a very slow group, uh, we were using the final version of the Ranger, oh, which sure. I think maybe gets my vote for most improved. Oh, class. yeah. And no, so, we, you know, we, you're we, hunting we, your prey, you use a deadly weapon, oh, yeah. you get a crit, you're All going of a sudden to town on some of those dice. monsters. Yeah, 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 it's pretty exciting. Yeah, he was playing a Ranger and he could not do that because no. he was playing the original uh, version. It's Ranger, a benefit you know, yeah. to, to uh -huh. getting printouts directly from the source, I guess. Well, I had them all, but I told them to, you know, to consult the downloads on their own and they chose not to. Uh, Fair enough. Oh, oops. So, oops. <laughs> but um, what do you guys want to add? I mean, before we start moving into like, I mean, there's so much direction as to where you guys can go. You've already talked a little bit about what's coming out in the near future. Um, I downloaded a campaign guide the last night, I think, but I don't. For Age of Ashes. Age of Ashes guide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The first I was going to say Ashes from Hell, but right. Uh. <laughs> I think you know, just to summarize it for me, one of the things that that I'm excited about, we're now less than 24 hours away from launching this game. Um, you know, by this time tomorrow, both Jason and I will be in the the exhibit hall, uh, helping people get their new game. And and, and uh, the thing I'm most excited about is. That's the moment where the game, not just for me and Jason and the people at Paizo, but for the whole world, that's the moment where the game transitions to what second edition actually is. Not like what I'm afraid it's gonna be or what I hope it will be or what I'm nervous about or what I'm excited about. It's no, this is the game. And this is a game I've been playing now and designing with for a couple of months in its final iteration. And I just keep falling in love with it 
more and more. And so I think we're going to see that process happen sort of with the audience as a whole. And, you know, look, it's a 640-page rule book. There's still rules I don't fully time. understand. You know, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, one of the things is, like, it is going to take people probably maybe an hour to make their first character the first time because you're going to want to read through how every feat works. And then say, oh, well, that, that affects concealment. How does concealment work in this edition? So there is going to be a bit of a learning curve. Um, yeah. But what I have seen is that the game is easier to teach new people, it's easier to learn, and that results in more immersive and more interesting play. And more options for design to do more interesting things, both as a GM and as a, as a, uh, a writer. And also then, as a player, you have more options to do cool stuff and to take advantage of that image you have in your head of the hero that you want to be. The rules are going to lead you to a path to make that happen. And that's always what Pathfinder's been all about. So in the same sense where, you know, Jason and I have been talking for the last, I don't know, what all, we're got to be creeping up on an hour at this point, but, you know, we're talking about what's changed and what's different, but there's actually a tremendous amount of stuff in terms of the heart of the game that I think is absolutely the same. And so it feels, I think the playtest is like really trying to push the boundaries a little bit, see what works, see what doesn't work. But now that we've gotten all that feedback and we've kind of uh, uh, sanded away some of the rough edges, gotten you know a little bit more insight into what the players are, uh, find important, and then continue to work on the game for almost another year. Um, we have a game that feels to me really true to the spirit of Pathfinder 1, and yet mechanically, a modern and current design that is not based off of an engine that fundamentally was being worked on in 1998. And that's yeah. what we had, you know, with Pathfinder coming off of 3.5, coming off of 3.0. And so being able to say, okay, what is it we're trying to achieve conceptually here, and then build the system from scratch, I think opens up a whole new world. And it's a familiar world, but it's a much deeper and enriching world. And that's what I'm super excited about. And so just to tie it all up, that's the journey that I've been on for the last two months. And that's the journey that for everybody else starts in like 20 hours from now. That's yeah, what I'm stoked and, about. And, and that gets around to the thing that I'm, I'm kind of really just pumped to see, which is tomorrow at 10 a.m., this game stops being the game that is ours. Right to being the game that is yours. And and uh, it stops being the thing that we have been just obsessing over for the past three years, and it becomes the game that, that a lot of people are playing. And it becomes the game that they use to tell their stories, to, to explore their character ideas, to, to write their big adventures. And over 10 years of Pathfinder, you know, I, uh, some of the most rewarding experiences of my career have happened when someone comes to tell me, about some amazing thing that happened or some way that the game transformed their life or or you know and and we're about to be able to do that all over again with a brand new game that does brand new things and uh, hopefully you know uh, branches out to an even bigger audience so um, you know that's that's kind of really an amazing thing and uh, that that starts tomorrow so all right yeah, <laughs> I know I know it's transforming my jamming <laughs> for the better, I hope. Oh, definitely for the better. I, it's no longer, uh, they got to fight my main guy. And now it's like, what can I do to him? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that that, that that is speak to the, the prep time and stuff, right? I think it's oh, yeah. easier to prep. Oh, yeah, definitely. Than oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. One. And, 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 and some, you know, so some of the math on the monsters is, is a little bit looser, and it's like, okay, the, so we, these are kind of the, the, air, the target areas you want to be at this level and stuff. You don't necessarily, it's not about showing your math to the eighth decimal point, and, and there's, a lo, there's a lot less pressure that you're doing something wrong uh, when you're prepping for the game, and I think that's great for GMs. I agree, wholeheartedly. All right, anything else? I think... Uh, we got a lot there. I think we're good. I we got a bunch of good books good. to go pile up and sell. Yeah. yeah, always a pleasure talking to you, Matt. You've been yeah. uh, you've been on the Pathfinder journey since almost the beginning. 2011, 2012. Yeah, so awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank well, you. Congratulations with the channel. And Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Hi, guys. Meet the Nibbles, who's gonna go down. <laughs> she just did decided not to go down my back, so. We'll do this for her so she's comfy. Uh, thanks for watching my video and I appreciate it. Uh, please, please hit the like button uh, and, and share it if you, you know, know somebody who might be interested. And of course, 
there's always Twitter and the Facebook thingy, and soon I have a newsletter coming. That'll be down there or in the link below, and my kitty cat loves that idea. Uh, so, anyway, uh, there was one more thing. There was one more thing. Oh, yeah. Subscribe. Be a part of my community, our community. Let's make it grow together. See you guys at a con somewhere or a local store or if I'm driving through the country, maybe a game club. I don't know. You're not going to go knock down my camera. Bye, guys.